hello everyone welcome welcome to a new kingdom transformation broadcast from for his glory ministries you know i my name is mark levesque and i'm here with my partner and friend rob welch who's the president and founder of for his glory ministries would you and work he does on a, those titles he, does, he a, does folks he does this every time and and i i don't know i maybe i need a i'm rob you know and that's good for me but he's also the cpo the the chief <laughs> preaching officer and he preaches in africa and wherever opportunity he has because people need to know jesus so that's well, that is true i do <laughs> agree is. with him there I, on the uh people need jesus that is true everyone everywhere needs jesus absolutely and so that today we have a treat for you because a question a lot of people are asking, they even search it online, is how can I know the will of God for my life? And so we're gonna we're gonna tackle that issue. That is a what was that what was that question again? How can I know God's will for my life? And so that's that's what we're gonna tackle today. And so you know, sounds like a good one, Mark. It does sound like a good one, Rob. How'd you pick that? I think it was God's will. <laughs> I think it's. Just that, ah, your that, good that's uh, what, re reform theological background. Well, I I, uh, I try to uh, I try to find out what God wants us to do on each broadcast, and so I really felt He wanted us to tackle this issue. Good. And, and uh, one of the things that's interesting is that if you want to know the purpose of something, someone's will for something, you ask the person who made it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, if you were if you saw if you were from uh, the Amazon and you came in and you'd never seen a car before and uh, you started looking at it. And you, you, you thought, uh, wow, uh, this, this, uh, ch the sound turns on when I turn these bu buttons on, on the radio or the, or the, uh, MP3 player. And, uh, this must be a, 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 st a studio that I can come and listen to music. Or you might see this, the reclining seats and think that it's a place to go and take a nap or, but if you, if, you, if you talk to the person who designed and built the car, they would say it's for transportation. And those other things are just, uh, you know, added features. And so who to ask the Do you ever of, take a nap in the car, Mark? I do. I've been, especially when we do long trips and we're driving. But uh, usually I'm the one driving. So a lot of times I'm, I'm, the, I'm not, I don't have a chance to sleep. But... Uh, but anyway, you can't sleep in a car. And I've spent nights in a car when we were uh, in between uh, locations or whatever. But all that aside, if you ask the creator of, an, of something, he knows the purpose. And he actually knows the, the purpose in every moment for that, for that person. So the person we should ask is our creator. And so we ask God the Father to show us his will. And uh, ironically, he's literally given us his will. And it's it's it can be leather bound, gold leafed, uh, written um, in, in many languages, but it's called the Bible. So, um, how would you go about finding God's will in the Bible, which is really God's God's will for our lives? It's His revealed will. Well, I'd read it. <laughs> I'd read it. That's the way you do it. Read it, and um, and then you do what it says. That's that's a, that's the kicker because some people are good on the reading part. A lot of people don't read. Uh, and some people read and don't do. And it talks about James that you're not to just be a hearer. Right. You led a Bible study on that ye uh, yesterday, Mark, and uh, a hearer, but we're to be a doer of the word. So not only hearing, but doing the word, which you said was a poet. What was a poet. Yes, He's acting it out, living it out. That was good. Rob's talking about a, a verse that is in James chapter 1. Verse and 22. Verse 22, and, and where, the, where the apostle James actually says, you know, don't, you know, be a doer of the word and not a forgetful hearer, forgetting what manner of person you are. So it's a very, it's a very deep verse, and it, it's often taught uh, in an incorrect way because people, people read that and they think, I got to get out and got to do something, so I'm going to do the first thing that comes into my mind. Well, that's not doing the will of God. How do you know the first thing you, you want to do, even though you're doing it because you want to serve God, is, the, is what God would have you do. And so the word doer there is actually poet in the, in the original Greek language. So he wants us to be a poet of the word. Well, well, what does that mean, being a poet of the word? The word poet actually in the Greek times, they used to have these plays. And uh, we've heard of uh, 
you know, Odysse Odysseus, and we've heard of Homer, uh, the Iliad, those ancient Greek uh, plays. And we've seen uh, the original one on Odysseus was with Kirk, Kirk Douglas, and he was uh, Kirk Douglas. Kirk was playing um, Odysseus. And, uh, and so he was, uh, he was acting out the, the poem. The play was written as, as if it was a poem because the, the, in Greek, the words rhymed. And so these poets were people who were actors and they knew their character and they acted out their character. So what James was telling us was, the Bible tells you who God says you are. Don't forget who you are. Look to the Bible, see how God has transformed you through his life, his presence, and then act like God would have you act. Act in the, in the character that God has put in you. Be the person God created you to be. And so we go to the Bible to be reminded of who we are. And, and you know, you, you start seeing things like Jesus said, they'll, they'll know they're my disciples because you love each other. And so one of the things that characterizes a follower of Jesus, and it's God's will, is that we love other people, even, even our enemies, he said to love. And so that's very different than the way the world does it. And so I wouldn't know that that's who I'm supposed to be unless I found it in the Bible. So Rob, if somebody was going to come to the Bible for the first time, what would you, what would you recommend? How would, they, how would they start? It's such a big book. How would, how would they start? Well, I often direct people to the Gospel of John. Um, I, I think it's, it's great to go to the Gospels because the whole message of the Bible is the message of Jesus. And so if I were talking to someone here in America, I would, I would probably encourage them to go uh, to the Gospel of John and start there and then and go through that and take your time. This is not a race. You want to spend time in God's word every day, but this is not a race. It, you read for transformation, not just for information. I think sometimes people read the Bible for information or out of a sense of obligation. And if it's just information or obligation, then you're going to end up empty. I mean, I had a time where I had a long fast that I did, not because God led me to, but because I decided to. And even though I fasted for many days, all I got out of it is I lost weight and I was irritable. I didn't have any spiritual breakthroughs like the other two times where I had a extended fast but I was led by the Holy Spirit to do it. So your motive behind something is going to affect what you get out of it, not just reading the Bible for reading the Bible's sake, because you could do that, but reading the Bible to encounter God and encounter his will for you and ask him to speak to you through his word, that's transformational. And that's what God wants to do in us he wants to transform us. This program is called Kingdom Transformation. Well, this transformation happens one heart, one life at a time. If your life and my life isn't being transformed by the resurrected Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, then we are missing it. We can say what we want about our spiritual beliefs and our, our religious activities, but if we're not being transformed by Christ, and if we're not being filled with and led by the Holy Spirit, then we're totally missing what God has for us. So that's, that's really kind of what I'm thinking. But I would point them to the Gospels, starting with John in many cases, or just go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then continue through the New Testament. That would be counsel I'd give for somebody wanting to get into the that, Word. That's great advice. Don't start at the beginning of the book like you no, do with normal books. You start in the New Testament so that you can get a feel for who Jesus Christ is, because mm -hmm. everything in the Bible ultimately points to him. Or if you want to start at the beginning, just read Genesis. You don't have to get through the first five books of the Bible to, to have an idea where God's going. You see the story laid out That's in true. Genesis. Genesis so awesome. if you really want to start at the beginning, you could go Genesis first, then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you want to do it, something like that. And then through the New Testament, then you come back 
and and you really see it filled out as far as um, the word. So we're going to go deep on you folks right now. We're going to go a little deeper than we normally do. So get ready. Uh, open. Well, you normally go pretty deep. This is going to go deeper. Okay. Okay. I'd like to just start off by telling you about this this lady named Ruth, and she was we we met Ruth in Africa in the DR Congo, in a city called Kisangani, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and she came to one of our our meetings. She heard the word and she just received Christ on her own. She just dropped her knees and received Christ. And you were teaching on kingdom authority. It wasn't what we would call a gospel message where we were calling people to respond to, to the, the gospel and receive Christ because this was pastors and church leaders and it was in preparation for an upcoming mission. But when Mark was talking about the authority that we have as believers, she fell under conviction and came to faith in Christ. Yeah, and she she's not wasn't an older woman. She had two young children, but uh, in the process of after coming to Christ and some of the stress from her family and so forth, she actually had a heart attack and died. And her family was very sad. They were weeping over her. Uh, after two hours, they began to wrap her body for the morgue, and uh, all of a sudden she comes back to life, yelling, "Jesus!" She yells the name of Jesus. And she was a Muslim who had received Christ and all of her family members were Muslim. So they're hearing Jesus and ultimately they're rejoicing in the name of Jesus because she came back to life and, and many of them have come to Christ. They came to believe. But when, when we got a chance to talk to her about the time she was dead, uh, we, uh, she said that she was in the throne room of heaven and she was standing before Jesus on his throne and she just said, I can't even describe the magnificence of Jesus in his ascended personage, ascended being. Um, and so she was just in awe of Jesus. And she looked down and she was holding a Bible in her hands. And when she saw the book, this beautiful Bible, she literally came back to life. That's when she woke up. And so my point here is to tell you that that's further confirmation, although we know this because Jesus said that the things that appear, the physical things in the earth, are made from the things that do not appear, the things in heaven. So there is a spiritual reality of the Bible in heaven. And so when you're reading the Bible, you're not just reading it for our, our peanut human brain. We're reading it for our spirit and soul. And so it is, it is the inside of us that is actually getting sustenance from the Bible. And so the thing is, when a person starts reading the Bible, they're like, oh man, I'm not getting this. But the thing is, if you keep pushing into it, what happens is the spiritual reality of the Bible that you're taking in starts to quicken your spirit and your soul. And so that you now will begin to understand where you never did before. And so the most important thing about reading and meditating the Bible is that you're tapping into a spiritual reality that is transforming your soul and to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I interrupt for a moment? Absolutely. I was actually done, Rob. Go, go ahead. Well, well, good, because I was getting ready to go. So okay. uh, this is critical. And, and I'm looking at 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. And this is the Apostle Peter, who was one of the core disciples of Jesus. Peter, James, and John went with Jesus and saw Jesus do things that none of his other disciples got to see. They saw Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. They were there on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. When Jesus appeared in his glory in a way they had never seen before, along he was there, but they but he he was transfigured before them. His his physical presence changed. And there with him were Moses and Elijah. So this same Peter, at the very end of his life, the Lord had revealed to him he was about to die, that his life was now ending. So Peter knew this, and he says this in this letter, that he's about to put off his earthly body. Here's what he says about the Scripture. Again, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. I want you to hear this. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Here you see Peter 
describing the Holy Spirit as the author of the word of God. So these are not just the words of men. These are not just human understanding. People sometimes have a wrong understanding. Why do Christians follow the Bible? We follow the Bible because these are words breathed out by God, by the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul talks about that. So you have divine authority and authorship. So if God is speaking to you, you and I better listen to that. So that's something we need to realize. These are not just words in some book. These are the very words of the living God revealing himself to us and showing us how we can be restored to God forever. So there's nothing more important for us as creatures to hear and obey the voice of our creator and trust in his son, Jesus. So that's something I, I want everybody listening to understand this. This is not just, you know, some other book. This isn't Shakespeare. This is the living God speaking to us that we might have life and look to the sun and live. Yes, I've heard it referred to, you know, most books we read to read the, to understand the, the book of the author. But when we read the Bible, we read the Bible to read the book of the Bible to understand the author of the book. And so it's, it's very different. We're coming to know God through his word, the Bible. And so, you know, it's one of the important things to know about Jesus Christ is Jesus always, always followed the will of his father throughout his entire life. He said that multiple times. But when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, which was the place where he was suffering with, with, uh, with, the, with the last major decision he had to make about going to the cross, because in that moment, Jesus could have left us high and dry. He could, have, he could have walked right out of it. When he was in that garden, he could have left. So he laid down his will to follow the will of his Father to pay for all of us so that all of us could have eternal life. And so I just wanted to, to read a, a, you know, a short part of this uh, Jesus time in that garden when he was wrestling with that decision and he gave his will over to the will of the father so this is in Luke chapter 22 verses 39 to 42 Rob would you like to read that sure Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him when he came to the place he told them pray that you will not enter into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, where he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So in that scripture, Jesus, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. He did want, not want to get whipped. He did, but even more than that, he didn't want to be separated from his father. He did not want to become sin. And so the Bible says Jesus became sin. He literally became sin. So we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. That was the only way it could be done. That, and the father knew it. Jesus knew that the father could do anything. He was looking for some other way. But Jesus also showed his human side in not wanting to go through this. And so he was going through it for all of us. And he was, he was wrestling with his will versus the father's for all of us, because we all wrestle with that. And so it's, it's so important that Jesus went through that to show that he put his will under the will of the father. And so one of the interesting things uh, that's important to understand is that um, we can literally ask God for his will. That's what Jesus did in the garden. He asked the father for his will. Also, one of the things that is interesting here is when, when you're in a spiritual journey, when you're looking to go deeper into spiritual things, a lot of times our flesh will get uh, sleepy. It's like there's, a, there's something called in the Bible, the spirit of slumber. And the disciples of Jesus were in a very strong spiritual moment. There was the, the universes were in disarray. The Son of God was was planning to be um, betrayed and taken to the cross. The evil was afoot, and, um, and and the forces of God were at work too, because the angels came later and strengthened Jesus. But there was a lot. There were a lot of spiritual things going on, 
And when people wrestle with spiritual things, a lot of times for the first time, and the Word of God, the Bible, is spiritual, sometimes we feel slumber. And so the responsibility that we have when we're starting to feel the spirit of, of slumber is to push in. We need to push in and, and let the let knowing that if I push into reading the Bible, I'll get over this this sleepiness, I'll get over this uh, dryness, and then God will God will be there to um, to fill me as I push through my flesh and receive from the Spirit. And so I just wanted to share that because a lot of people wrestle with that when they approach the Bible. They wrestle like, oh, this is too deep. I, I get nothing out of it. I fall asleep when I read. We really need to, to take Jesus' advice that he gave his disciples, where they said, pray that you don't enter into temptation. We need to pray, Lord, please open my eyes and my heart to your word when I read it. Please, Lord, help me to stay awake and get the most out of this possible. And God will enable us to receive his blessing when we do that. And so that, that, I think that's an important uh, part of what we were talking about. Let, let us know that when we read the will of God, I mean, I'm sorry, the Bible, the Word of God, we are reading the will of God. We are, we are reading what God has for us, but we need the Holy Spirit to awaken that. So we ask for God's help when we read. It's a holy, it's a wonderful thing that we need to do more and more. So, um, you know, Rob, could you just share with the folks a little bit and, and maybe um, lead them in a prayer? Well, I think um, I think we all need to realize that we can't go through life alone. A and so many of us do that. We try to make it on our own. I know that's a real problem here in America. I mean, if, if you look, those of, of us who are, are Americans by birth or by citizenship, uh, we, we have this, this sense of independence. We have this sense of individual freedoms and individual rights. And that's something that's common uh, to the American people. Even though we're very diverse, uh, freedom... And individuality is very important to us in this nation. And so we don't like to admit that we need help. And if you go to other parts of the world, and we minister a lot in Africa, you, you find a different dynamic where there's this sense of you're a part of a community and you're more collective in your understanding and seeing yourself as part of a family, part of a tribe, part of a group. But, but there, there's this sense of shame and not wanting to bring shame to oneself. So there's a hiding on that side from shame and being exposed. So if you look from the perspective of, of those of us who tend to be in individualistic, we don't want to admit we need help and that we can't do it alone. Or if you're from Africa or Asia or Latin America or a culture that is, is more uh, collective uh, focused, there you don't want to bring shame to yourself. And so you, you want to hide uh, your need from that standpoint. But either way, whoever you are, whatever your culture is, whatever your experience is, whatever your religious background is, we're hiding. We hide from God. And we hide from each other. And that is because of our sin and our shame. And we don't want to come into the light, but God tells us to come into the light. Jesus entered into this dark world that you and I might be restored to the one who gives light and life, life eternal, not just physical life, but spiritual life and life forever with him. God gives you that. 
when you embrace his son. You see, when sin entered the world, there was a separation that took place from us and God. God created you and me to be in relationship with him. When he created Adam and Eve, he created them to be in relationship with him forever. But when they disobeyed God, that relationship was broken and they went into hiding. And ever since Adam and Eve, and we're their descendants, the Bible tells us, we've been hiding from God. So God sent his son, whom is called the second Adam, the man from above. He sent Jesus. It talks about that in the book of Romans. And he sent Jesus to do what you and I couldn't do. Jesus lived the perfect life. He never, never disobeyed God, even when it cost him his life, even when it cost him being separated from the Father. When Jesus was on the cross, he was separated from his Father. What Mark had us look at, that passage where Jesus is crying out to his Father right before he goes to the cross, Jesus was most concerned about being separated from his Father because he had never, in all eternity past, which we can't comprehend, he had never been separated from his Father before. And he never would be again. But in that time on the cross, and until the resurrection, there was a separation. And Jesus was separated from the Father so that you and I wouldn't have to be. I want you to understand, this is heaven and hell, life and death. This is no joke. This is everything. What you do with Jesus is everything. Either you receive him or you reject him. But Jesus already did everything for you. He took all of your sin. Every single one of your sins were nailed with him to the cross. He took all of your judgment, all of God's wrath for your sin and mine, poured out on Jesus. He fully took our place. And when he was dying, he cried out, It is finished. Once and for all, Jesus finished the work. He brought victory and life to everyone who looks to him. He died that you might live. But he didn't stay dead in the ground. On the third day, God raised him from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. And he's calling you. And he's calling me. And he's calling everyone to look to him and live. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And God himself is calling you now to believe in him, to trust in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Turn from your sin. Turn from living from your, for yourself and turn to Jesus. Look to Jesus and live. Now is your time. I'm going to lead in a prayer of surrender. And this invitation is for everyone who needs Christ. Everyone who needs forgiveness of sins. Everyone who needs eternal life. If you will turn to Jesus, God will freely give you life. Life forever with him. You're forgiven. You're free the Bible says you're a new creation. That happens the moment you receive Christ. And now is your time. If you'll receive Christ, I want you to pray this prayer of surrender with me out loud to God. This is between you and God. But I want to lead you in a prayer of surrender that you might receive this life now in Jesus' name. So if you'll receive Jesus as your Savior, pray this. Heavenly Father, I know I've sinned against you.
and that my sin has separated me from you. I know I deserve death. But Father, I know that Jesus is your son. And that Jesus took my death for me on the cross. He took all my sin, all my shame, because you love me. And Lord Jesus, I know that you are alive. I know that you're risen from the dead. And you're at God's right hand. And Lord Jesus, right now, I put my faith in you you alone for my salvation for life eternal Thank you, Lord. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for making me a child of God. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And lead me, Father. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, boy, if you prayed that prayer, you've taken the first step onto a broader life with the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. And when you leave this world and step into his arms, it's awesome. If you need more information or you'd like help, you can go to forhisglorymen.org. We have a booklet there that you can you can use, read, download. It's free, and uh, we um, we also uh, have um, other resources there for you. And you can get uh, you can get you actually you can you can listen to our podcasts on our website as well, and you can also get other recordings of what we've uh, we've talked about in the past. So um, it was great having this time with you today, and. Uh, you know, stay, come on back for a, a week, uh, every Friday at 2 o'clock Central Time. We do a broadcast, and then get your podcast wherever podcasts are available. Again, thank you. This is Mark Levesque and Rob Welch from For His Glory Ministries. Be blessed. <laughs>